So in Ecclesiastes, we're, we're talking to King Solomon is talking here and, and unfortunately he's been, not unfortunately, he's been gifted by God with incredible wisdom, supernatural wisdom. The unfortunate thing is he's decided to try to live his life without applying that wisdom that God has given him and that relational in that relationship. He's just, I'm just going to use my wisdom for my own selfish desires. I'm going to figure out the meaning of life by, you know, partying, drinking, drugging, building, whatever, laughing, you name it, anything in, we can do. And he's doing that apart from a relationship with God. And if you remember the last verse in, or verses in uh, chapter six, uh, our backslidden buddy, King Solomon, uh, ended this depressing chapter six with two cynical questions because he's trying to live life apart from God. He's, he's, and, and he asked two questions. He says, who knows what good, what's good for a man while he passes through this life? And his second question was, who can tell him what will happen after he's gone? Well, because of Jesus Christ and for all of you who are born again to the spirit of God and read your Bibles, you know who knows what's good for a man as he passes through? I do. And you do. And who can tell him what happens after he's gone? I can. And you can. The Bible says that goodness and mercy are going to follow me all the days of my life. And then I'm going to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The good is his divine power is going to give us everything we need for life and godliness. And that according to uh, the knowledge of him who called us by, our, by his own glory and goodness. And he's given us these, his very great and precious promises right here. And this isn't just to sit on a shelf and then you to sell at goodwill and donate. This is for you to develop a relationship with Jesus. You know what? If you, I, I double dog dare you. Just pick a book in the New Testament, any book, any book you want. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, James. Just start in chapter 1, verse 1. And just read a chapter a day. And every day just say, Jesus, will you speak to me? Even if you don't feel it at first or sense it at first, every day, Lord, will you teach me something? And you know what? He will. And he'll strengthen you. And he'll encourage you. And he'll challenge you. And he'll convict you. Because that's what our God does. And I know what will happen after we're gone. Because the Bible says there's a heaven and a hell. And whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. But whoever rejects Jesus will not see life. For God's wrath will remain on them. Now, the Bible says I can be confident of this. If I'm saved, if I've given my life over to Jesus, that I, if, when I'm absent from the body, he says I'll be present with the Lord. Isn't that amazing? That's a wonderful promise. Now, you've made it all the way, we've made it together all the way to Ecclesiastes chapter 7. So the first thing I want to say is in this depressing book, congratulations. Woo! I feel like... We've made it to uh, the final half. If you, got, if you watch sports at all, you know, you're like, whew. Hey, don't forget to tell me how Eric is later. Uh, but I want to say congratulations. You made it to the final half of this uh, book of Ecclesiastes. So you need a little bit of encouragement. I know I do. In chapters 1 to 6, King Solomon was basically living life for his own self-gratification apart from God. And he's seeking fulfillment and meaning and pleasure. He's basically hedonist. And he's, he's figuring out that life is meaningless without a relationship with Jesus Christ. And that's what he's come at soap bubbles, Havel in the Hebrew. And in chapter 7, he shifts gears. And it almost takes on like a proverb-like. I don't even know how to say it. Almost like the book of Proverbs. And, and, he, and he's trying to leave his hedonistic lifestyle. And he's He's trying to become, as he's getting a little bit older, he's going to become a little bit moralistic. And he's going to give us advice because he still has that wisdom. The problem is that, unfortunately, he might be a moral guy, but he's still not a God guy. And so even though he's got some wisdom in here, tucked in here, and he has wisdom and intelligence and all that, so he can see a lot and understand a lot, he doesn't have that vital life-giving relationship. So how he applies it to life is hit or miss. And, and sometimes he's way off and depressing. It's meaningless because he's trying to do it without God. And then sometimes he's spot on. So it's such a difficult book because 
One verse is like you're like, you'll even see it in verse one. The first part of verse one, right on. The second part is like, oh, well, that's depressing. And it's whack. And so this is what you get with, and that's what you get with anybody with one foot. I know Jesus, I, I know, but I'm not living for him. You know what I can tell you? You're miserable and you're getting resentful and you're getting bitter. And you're just like, this is meaningless. This is pointless. This whole church thing, right? This whole Jesus thing, whatever, you know? Because that's what you'll do. You'll end up just like Solomon. How long will it take you before you break? And then you end up saying like Solomon, life's meaningless apart from God. It's not a good place where he's at right now. Now, in the end, I won't spoil it too much for you, but in the end, he comes around. But... Right now, he's in a bad spot. So as we go through 7, chapter 7, realize as we go through it, it's hit or miss, okay? Depressing, ungodly, impressing, and godly, all right? Look, look, uh, look what uh, you even notice that in, in verse 1, okay? He starts off the first part of chapter 7, verse 1. Listen to me. It, this, is, this is spot on. He says, right, a good name is better than fine perfume. Now, can I tell you something? When I think of perfume, you know what? We think of it, whoop de doo You can go into Macy's, you can buy, buy some perfume, you know. I think when I was 18, my, my cologne was Drekar. <laughs> I don't even, I think it smelled terrible, actually, now I think about it, but back then it just sounded manly and cool. So I'm going to use a gallon of it every time I go out and make people gag. But I, I am cool. Right? So, because the name, I thought the name was cool. And, but he's saying good names. Back then, perfume was, I mean, they didn't even have showers, you know. I mean, imagine, you know, desert heat. Think about this. So perfume was invaluable. There was a couple times, twice actually, where a woman came and, and took this alabaster jar. One time broke it over Jesus' head and, and another time broke it over his feet a different time at a Pharisee's house and they broke it over and, and it was a beautiful thing and, it was, and, and this alabaster jar of perfume was like her entire life savings. That's how valuable perfume. So he's saying right here, Solomon's saying, listen, he says a good name is better than that fine perfume, that costly, though it costs you everything. That's that good name, that good heart, that good character. And, and, and he, he's so right, you know? He starts off well by saying that, right? That good character is, is better than the sweetest, finest, most expensive perfume. And, and Proverbs, which um, Solomon wrote later, he says this. It says in Proverbs 22.1 that a good name is to be chosen rather than great riches and loving favor better than silver and gold. It's like to have that good... Now, can I tell you something? You can have a good name. Now, let me rephrase that. You can have a great name, but not a good name. You know what I'm saying? Uh, can I tell you a very popular name that everybody recognizes? It's great, right? Not great like woohoo, but great like you recognize it, right? This guy. That's a great name. Everybody knows it. But is it a good name? He killed millions of people. I've been to Dachau in Germany. I've seen the ovens where they would burn people. Uh, camps, and it's terrible. <clears throat> or Stalin. Stalin, actually, the, the, uh, one of the fathers of communist Soviet Union, he probably killed more people than even Hitler. Right? This communist, he, he killed like 18 million people or 20 million people. And then there's Mao. I couldn't even fit him on there. The Chinese socialist communist. He killed dictator, communist dictator. He, he probably killed 45 million people. And, but you know what? If Stalin and Russia, there's still statues to him. They, they venerate. And, and Hitler, believe it or not, we had a guy in here from a ministry that said before he got saved and started worshiping the true God, this is the guy he worshiped, Hitler. Terrible. Before he came to know Jesus, he was a racist. He was this. Now he loves Jesus and loves everybody. And, and Mao, they've got, they almost venerate him. They've got great names, but they don't have good names. Jesus 
is a good name. In fact, it says in Acts chapter 10, verse 38, that he was a God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. And it says that he went around doing good wherever he went to everybody, whether they deserved it or not. You remember he even washed the, dis the disciples' feet, even Judas's feet. He went around doing good wherever he went. And you know what? So should you, so should I. It's a fruit of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes I don't want to do good because people aren't nice to me. When I do good, they misinterpret it. They this, that, the other. You know what? Do good anyway because you do it for Jesus. Does that make sense? A good name is to be chosen rather than riches and rather than gold. Amen? As Christians, we are to bear Jesus' good name. You know that's what Christians mean, right? Christ, Christians is actually two words, Christ and Tians in Greek. Okay? So what is, Tian means little. So basically Christians is your little Christs. You are supposed to be little Christs showing his love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control to others so that when they see you, even though they don't want to see anything good and I don't want to have to look at that, they just can't help it. Dang it, I guess they are kind of, I don't want to think that way, but they are nice. Oh, probably. We're to be that sweet smelling aroma. <laughs> In fact, the Bible says as we bear his name to others, we're supposed to take that. So listen, do your friends know you for being loving and kind? Do they? Do, you, do your, your husband and wife, do the friends around you, do the congregation know you for being a little Christ? If not, you can pray like me, Jesus, help me. I need to decrease and you need to increase. Does that make sense? Listen, 1 Corinthians 2.14 in the Living Bible, I like how it says this. He says, thanks be to God for through what Christ has done, he's triumphed over us. So now, wherever we go, he uses us to tell others about the Lord and to spread the gospel like a sweet perfume. So listen, when you're going out to your day and your work and your school and your friends and your Bible studies and your game nights, your, that, your goal isn't just to play a game or do a job. Your goal is to smell sweet for the Lord Jesus Christ. Does that make sense? I'll never forget this. Um, we had a, a Bible study at our house. Amanda Panda, I don't know, I saw her here earlier, but Amanda Panda is somewhere um, outside with the kids. Okay, yeah. So I, Amanda Panna gave a great uh, testimony one time. I remember specifically sitting at her house, Josh and Amanda, they were sitting out there, and Amanda was sitting by the pool, and all the kids were listening, the teenagers. And I remember she said that we are to be uh, a sweet, wholesome fragrance unto the Lord and to others. She said, and I'll never forget this, she's like, it's like when you make, and maybe it stuck with me because I'm a foodie, you know, I'm a food yeah. guy. So, of course, she's like, it's like when you make fresh brownies or, you know, you got the hot chocolate chip cookies you pull right from the oven. You know that smell? You're like, oh, and it's ooey gooey, right? And she's like, that's what we're supposed to be smelling like to others. The Bible says in, in 2 Corinthians 2, 15, as far as God's concerned, there is a sweet, wholesome fragrance from our lives, and that's Jesus. That's why we need him, <laughs> It is the fragrance of Christ within us, and it's an aroma to both the saved and the unsaved. Now, to be honest, sometimes the unsaved doesn't want to smell that smell. You know what I'm saying? To the saved, it's like, oh, yes. When you, when you are living for Jesus, can I tell you, it encourages me. When you're taking an experiencing God course and I'm seeing you learn and grow, and I'm saying, oh, it encourages me. When I see you persevere and you're here each week and you're, serving God or you're, or, or you're coming to learn, oh, my heart rejoices. It's a sweet-smelling aroma. The second part of this verse, unfortunately, is, is a little bit worse. He starts off, a good name is better, look at verse 1, than fine perfume, and then the day of death is better than the day of birth. <laughs> well, thanks there, Saul. Now, I'll be honest, he may just be being morbid or morose because he, if you'll notice by as we go through this, he's going to say it many times, life is meaningless. 
man, it's better when I die. He, it might mean that. Um, that's, it's, it is what he says. The day of death is better than the day of birth. But can I tell you something? He may mean it differently. But if you're a believer in Jesus Christ and you've lived your life for him, right? Not perfect. Is any, any Christian here perfect? Okay, good. Because none of us are. But we are forgiven, right? And we do want to follow him. So I can tell you, if you've lived a life for Jesus Christ, in one sense, the day of your death is going to be better than your day of your birth. And the memory that people will have of you will also be a memory of Christ Jesus. And there's nothing more powerful than that. In fact, that's not just Pastor Darren's word. That's, that's what it says in God's word. In Proverbs chapter 10, verse 7, the Bible says, the memory of the righteous, those who live for Jesus Christ, those who bear his name, live with that good name, will be blessed. But listen to this. The name of the wicked will rot. There might be some people in your life, you know what? <sighs> kind of glad they're gone. Not going to say it out loud, but woo! And then there's some that, you know what? <clears throat> you might really miss. Man, that was a good, that person really loved me, really cared about me even though I fought them all the time. They really did care. I, I like what Spurgeon said about this, that, that second part of verse 1. He said, he was talking about life is difficult and it's filled with troubles and said, but he said, I want you to think about death. He said, death is the end of dying for a Christian. There's no more. He goes, on the day of a believer's death, it is forever done with. Forever. The saints who are with God shall never die anymore. He says, life is wrestling, life is struggle, life is trouble. Oh, yeah, that's true. But death is the end of the conflict for a Christian. It is a rest victory. Isn't that awesome? And for those of you who don't know, for those who know Jesus Christ, listen, I want you to really think about this verse. This is in the book of Revelation, uh, 21.4, I think. It says, he will, ready? He will wipe every tear from our eyes. He says, there'll be no more death, nothing, no more sorrow. Think about that. No more sorrow ever again. No more crying. Listen, even as a Christian, have we cried? Have you had sorrow? Have you experienced death in your life? Have you experienced pain in your life? Because we live in a sinful world. But there's going to be no more of all that. He said, all these things are gone. How long? So in another sense, maybe the day of death is better even than your day of birth. Here's what the Bible also says. And listen, this is not my word. This is God's word. Ready? <laughs> he says, and this is in uh, Corinthians. I think it's 2.9. I had to look. Yep. He says, no eye has even seen, no ear has even heard. And then he goes on to say in this verse, he says, your mind hasn't even conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. Is that not amazing to you? You can even live your best, most selfish life now for yourself, and then you're going to have an eternity of weeping and sorrow and pain and regret in hell, or you can live your life for Jesus now and have no more pain, no more sorrow, and you can't even, it says, even if you think about it, mind blown, you can't even conceive it, what God has prepared for those who love him. And you remember that. Amen? Wow is right. It should be a wow. It's meant to be a wow. So that was just verse one. So we're going to speed up a little bit. You can see why I couldn't get through the 30 verses. Okay. All right, so here we go. Okay, it's verse 2. Right. Here we go. Verse 2. Onward and upward. He says, it is better to go into the house of mourning, look at it with me, than to go into a house of feasting, for death is the destiny of every man, and the living should take heart. Well, uh, verse 2, <laughs> He's basically saying it's better to go to a funeral than a fun house. And, and why would you say that, Pastor? Why? 
It's because when we're confronted with death, we're for, forced to think about our own mortality. Life, death, heaven or hell, who are we living for? You know what? We don't want to think about it most of the time. If you're not living for Jesus, you don't want to think about that. I don't want to think about death. I don't want to think about, I don't want to go to a funeral. I don't want to go to the hospital. Keep me away. I just want to watch TV all day. But that's not healthy. The Bible says in Psalm 90, verse 12, teach us, Lord, to number our days so we can gain a heart of wisdom. Because when we think about some of these things, it causes us to reevaluate our life. If you're just out partying or anesthetizing yourself, you're not thinking about these things. You should think about it. You don't know how long you have. I don't know how long I have, right? Think about these things. Teach us to number our days. Verse 3 and 4. Says, he says, sorrow is better than laughter. Wow, that's weird. Sorrow is better than laughter? Because a sad face is good for the heart. What? Verse 4 says, the heart of the wise is in the house of mourning. For the heart of fools is in the heart, heart of pleasure. In the house of pleasure. And, and so... Basically, and again, this goes against every fiber of my being of what my flesh wants, but I think he's right. It is better when it comes to our hearts learning about God because we tend to learn more in our times of suffering than we do in our times of partying. Really, when you're part we're not thinking about God most of those times, right? When times are tough, where do you turn? Now we're thinking about the Lord. <clears throat> I'll have people mock me, make fun of me, but you know what, when they're in trouble... Pastor, can you pray for me? Uh, yeah. Okay, sure. Maybe this happened to you. Right? Listen, that suffering has value because it causes us to think about the Lord and reevaluate our life. Listen to this. This is a bizarre one. Ready? Paul says this. This is in Philippians 129. He says, For it has been granted to you as a Christian, on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him. It's been granted. Like, it, here's a blessing for you. Now, in my flesh, that doesn't make any sense, does it? But that suffering, honestly, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. The Bible says, listen, and, and this might go against a lot of the health and wealth teachers, but you have to know what the Bible says for yourself. Listen. The Bible says in Psalm 119.71, it was good for me to be afflicted so that I might learn your decrees. It was good that these, I went through this trouble. Now, you're not saying that in the trouble, right? Unless you're really spiritual. But afterwards, you know what I can say? You know, I hate to say it. It was probably good that that happened to me because it caused me to think more about the Lord and where I was at with him. Nine out of 10 times. That trouble, that affliction. In fact, not only that, it says in Psalm 119.67, before I was afflicted, I went astray. But now I obey your word. It's drawn me back, that suffering, that trouble, that affliction. Verse 5 and 6 says, It is better to heed a wise man's rebuke than listen to the song of fools. Like a crackling like the crackling of thorns under the pot, so is the laughter of fools. This too is meaningless. And so when he's going through verses five and six, he's saying a wise man's rebuke is better than a fool's praise. Even though the rebuke hurts, you can learn from it. King Solomon says constructive criticism can wisely help or warn us, but he compares the praise of fools to an empty word and song or rapidly burning thorns in a campfire. There's a lot of snap, crackle, pop, but no real heat is generated. No fire, no fuel. It, nothing really good. No lasting good. The Bible says this in uh, Proverbs. It says, if you listen to constructive criticism, you'll be at home among the wise. <laughs> and I like that picture because well, what is that hammer hammering? You don't do that. I don't know much about construction, a couple of people here in here will tell you that. However, I know that's bad. So we should listen to constructive criticism. 
Why, why is mom telling me? Why is dad telling me? Why is my friend? Why is that preacher? He's telling me. I'm telling you this because I love you. God's trying to tell you this because he loves you. You can listen to it or not. It's your choice. You know what I mean, Jelly Bean? It goes on to say, if you reject discipline, you only harm yourself. But if you listen to correction, you can grow in understanding. And that's what we need to be doing. Growing in our understanding. Another proverb says in Proverbs 9, 8, and 9, it says, do not rebuke mockers or they'll hate you. But if you rebuke the wise person, they're going to love you for it. Some folks in here, I've, I've had, to, had a, Pastor Gary and I, we've had difficult conversations with them. And you know what? They're still here. And they, and they, and they actually are thankful and love us for it. And then there's some, ah, you're just me, you're so we love you, dude. It's just we know that this ends. So learn. A wise person, rebuke the wise, they'll love you. Okay? It goes on. What, is it? what do we have? Verse 7? It says, extortion turns a wise man into a fool, and a bribe corrupts the heart. A bribe corrupts the heart. So getting your way by coercion or bribery is going to corrupt your heart, either by the person you're bribing or coercing or your own. And the Bible says this in Proverbs 15, 27, the greedy bring ruin to their household. The one who hates bribes will live. Pastor, it's just how to get things done. Listen, I know how to get things done. I was, I was almost 30 when I got saved. I did a lot of business, and can I tell you something? It wasn't always good business. Let's just say bribery was a part of... I, here's what I did. I, this is what I did in my mind, because I didn't get saved till later in life. Bribery to me was just an expense. That's how I saw it. At least, or that's what I told myself this. But it really isn't. The one who hates bribes will live. There's a way that God wants us to do things. It's not the way the world wants us to do things. It's different. We're to be different than the world. That's just, it is. It's not a judgmental thing. It's just, that's what he wants from us. You do it honestly. You choose the way you do business, but me and my house, I want to serve the Lord. Goes up. Verse 8, he says, The end of the matter is better than the beginning, and patience is better than pride. And so when you're living patiently according to God's wisdom, the end is even better than the beginning. That's the truth. But Satan, on the other hand, always tempts with the best, and an ending is always worst, isn't it? He puts all his best stuff right in front of you in the beginning, and then traps you at the end. He gives you the poison later on once you're trapped and once you're hooked. Doesn't that make sense? God says, hey, you go through the hard times now and you'll be blessed later. Verse 9. Verse 9 goes on to say, do not be quickly provoked in your spirit. Uh-oh. For anger resides in the lap of of fools. Now, right now it gets very quiet. Because the anger doesn't display a man or woman's righteousness, the righteousness God desires. We all get angry, don't we? Let's be honest. Okay, we've all screwed up, right? So you're not, but it says to be angry and sin not in your anger. Right? Listen, that verse 9, it's, he's basically Solomon saying, don't be quick to fly off the handle. As somebody once said, you can tell the size of a man by what it takes to make him lose his temper. As believers goes, to hold on to bitterness, anger, resentment, blah, 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 is just foolish. In fact, I I'll, I'll, won't spend too much time on this, but Proverbs 14.29 says, People with understanding, they learn to control their anger. But a hot temper shows great foolishness. Because it doesn't represent Christ. Capiche? Verse 10. Do not say, 
Why were the old days better than these? For it is not wise to ask such questions. So verse 10, when it comes to the church, I said, oh, pastor, we could just get back to the early church or, or there'd be the world. Let me tell you, you know what's happened in the early church? People were getting drunk at communion services. I'm not kidding you. You read the book of Corinthians. There were people sleeping with, their, I, don't even, I don't even want to get it. But the, basically, a lot of Paul's letters are correction. Sexual immorality, getting drunk at the church services. Yeah, let me take communion. Woo! Down a few. Even the women had to be quiet. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> See how I'm using self-control? Right there. <laughs> Natalie, you've blessed us many times with godly wisdom. We're thankful. I tease, but anyway. But the bottom line is people were just as sinful and self-focused way back then as they are now. It just, they just take on different forms. And, and so it's better, he's saying, it's better just to face reality right here, right now, courageously, lovingly, biblically, just handle it and live victoriously. Don't say, oh, this is better than the old days. Just go forward, deal with what you have to deal with in a godly way right now. Amen? Yeah. All right. Let's go. Verse uh, 11 and 12. It says, Wisdom is like an inheritance. It is a good thing and benefits those who see the sun. Wisdom is a shelter, as money is a shelter. But the advantage of knowledge is this. The wisdom perseveres the life of the possessor. So he's talking about wisdom is even more valuable. Um, so even though Solomon's, he's not living for the Lord Currently, he still recognizes the benefit of godly wisdom, having that godly wisdom in your life. And, and he's saying that a benefit of that wisdom is being balanced with all of life's details that are coming in and changes. He says, wisdom is better protection than any monetary inheritance because money can be stolen, money can be lost, money can depreciate in value. Hey, let's just be honest. What, a year and a half ago, all of us had about 10, 20% more money. Where'd it go? Poof, gone. Well, that's all I'm going to say. Oh, I have some great lines, but the Lord told me not to say it. Anyway, the point I'm trying to make is that wisdom, godly wisdom, it never depreciates in value. The same stuff that I looked, I realized I read in my experience in God 20 years ago. I was sharing this with the course. I reread it. It's the same, applies just as powerfully 20, 25 years ago as it does today. What? what? Because God's word and God's wisdom never changes. Isn't that cool? Heaven and earth will pass away, but God's word is going to go on forever. Isn't that cool? So, and think about this, why wisdom is better than wealth. When a person acquires wealth without wisdom, you know what? A lot of times, crash and burn. You know how many sports stars have had tons of money, but they haven't had good godly advice or wisdom? It's all gone now. Do you know how many lottery winners? Millions, hundreds of tens of millions, hundreds of millions, and they're bankrupt? It's actually a common thing. And they say to themselves, I wish I never would have even won it in the first place. So wealth without godly wisdom ain't so great. The Bible says this about wisdom, and I love this scripture picture because what do you see growing out of the Bible? Roots. Thank you. That's what you see. It's roots. Because if you are rooted in God's word and the wisdom that he has, you're going to bear fruit in due season. In due season. You're going to be able to handle a drought, winds, right? Whatever is thrown at you because you're well-rooted. God's word says in, in Proverbs 4, 6, and 7, do not forsake wisdom and she will protect you, God's wisdom. Love her and she will watch over you. It goes on to say in that same verse, the beginning of wisdom is this. Get wisdom, godly wisdom, what he's saying. Though it costs you all you have, get that understanding. Because there's nothing more valuable than that. And I'm telling you, that's the truth. Verse 11. 
Verse 11. My poor little eyes. <laughs> no. Security? No. Actually, we are actually verse 13. Sorry. Verse 13. It says, consider what God has done. Who can straighten what he has made crooked? And, and just what he means by that, just real quickly, is, and I like how the Living Bible understands this verse. It's helped me to understand it. I think I have it here. It says, see the way God does things and fall into line. Don't fight the facts of nature. Who can straighten what he has made crooked? I like how it says that. And then verse 14 says, uh, this, verse 14 says, when times are good, be happy, and when times are bad, consider God has made the one as well as the other. Therefore, a man cannot discover anything about his future. And so God says there's plenty of times to enjoy good times, and there's tough times to learn and grow. God provides both, almost like Job. Whether you're in a time right now, some of you are experiencing good times. When I say, hey, good morning, everybody. It's great to see you. You're like, oh, good morning, Pastor Darren. Great to see you too. So glad to be here. And some of you are like, I'm saying, hey, good morning, everybody. It's so great to see you. It's so great to be here. And you're like, I'm here. I want to die. I've, I've been there. I'm just being honest. Sometimes I've been at church and that's how I felt. I, I'm here. I made it. I, I want to die. I'm not happy. Not really it's a good morning, but I'm here, right? But blessed be the name of the Lord. So whether you're having good times, rejoice in them. When you're having bad times, say blessed be the name of the Lord. Rejoice in them. Rejoice always. Does that make sense? Listen, because God's going to use it. He's going to work some of the things to good, does it say? Right. Listen what Job says. And Job had some pretty bad times, okay? For those of you who don't know the story. He says, listen, this is in Job 121, that New King James Version. He says, naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I shall return. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. But he said, blessed be the name of the Lord. That's us as Christians. We trust in you, Jesus, no matter what happens. Make sense? Verse 15 to 18. Gary, I'm afraid to ask. Oh, Pedal to the metal. 15 to 18. Here we go. In the meaningless of... In verses 15 to 18. In this meaningless life of mine, again, on, not with God in mind. In the meaningless life of mine, I have seen both of these things. A righteous man perishing in righteousness and a wicked man living long in his wickedness. So don't be, don't be over-righteous, neither be over-wise. Why destroy yourself? Do not be over-wicked and do not be a fool. Why die before your time? And verse 18 says, it's good to grasp the one and not let go of the other. The man who fears God will avoid all extremes. Now, here's one of these times where Solomon's like way off base. So Solomon's not looking at anything in the light of eternity. So he's just looking at things under the S-U-N, not under the S-O-N, right? So it seems with this horizontal thinking, he's just thinking things in the worldly way or in a fleshly mind. It doesn't matter if you're righteous or wicked as long as you're balanced. Righteousness does not always pay and wickedness sometimes does pay. So what does it matter? He says in his shallow, worldly, unbiblical thinking, you know, just don't be too righteous so that you're persecuted or martyred. Don't be too wicked so God zaps you out of existence. You know, just kind of be balanced. But God says that thinking is actually unbalanced. Listen, it, oh, you don't want to be too righteous. You don't want to be too... No, that's the opposite. You know what? God does want you to be righteous. Do you think Jesus was balanced in not being too righteous? Jesus, you know, did Jesus ever say, you know what, guys, I don't want you to be too godly. Let's just, let's, don't be too wicked. A little wickedness is good. Did you ever say that? No, of course not. What about Paul? Was he like, you know, hey, I don't want to be too, too much. I don't want people to, no, he was like, he's singing in prison in shackles. You know, the disciples boiled, they're praising God. And, and after they've been beaten with rods, Peter, what about the prophets? Sometimes they were rejected, persecuted. It's part of the deal. In fact, listen, if you're really, you're going to be unbalanced in a, in a coup, you're, you're unbalanced. 
Pastor said I was unbalanced. But I mean, God wants you all in. That's the balance. All. All. In fact, here's what he says. And and people aren't always going to like it. He says, everyone who actually wants to live a godly life, you're going to be persecuted. People are not going to like everything I say. They're not. They're going to say bad things. But you know what? Can I be honest? I said some bad things before I was saved. Christians who were doing, living the same way you were trying to live. Of course, I asked for forgiveness for that. But there, Jesus said, listen, a servant's not greater than her master. If they hate me, the world hates me, and my righteousness, they're going to hate you because you're trying to display me and my righteousness to the world. Right? Verse 19 says, Wisdom makes one wise man more powerful than ten rulers of the city. And so in that, he's just saying when a godly person applies godly wisdom, you get godly power. Proverbs says in 21, 22, one who is wise can go up against, using godly wisdom here, can go up against the city of the mighty and pull down the strongholds in which they trust. That godly wisdom is more powerful than anything the enemy has to offer. Verse 20 says, There is not a righteous man on earth who does what is right and never sins. Well, can I tell you something? That's absolutely right. That's what the Bible says. Right? The Bible, that's why we need Jesus. The Bible says, listen to this, there's no one righteous. Listen, there's no good. He's a good person. No, he's not. He's a sinner. You are a sinner. Oh, pastor said I was a sinner. I'm a sinner. That's why I need a Savior Jesus to reach down. That's why he got nailed to that cross, right? He took all the punishment for all my unrighteousness, all my sin. It was nailed to the cross, right? He took upon all that to himself so that anyone who would want to believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. That's why he's reaching down to us. Isn't that amazing? I love it. It's amazing. That's what Romans 3.10 says. Verse 21, 22. Do not pay attention to every word people say, or you may hear your servant cursing you. For you know in your heart that many times you yourself have cursed others. And I don't know what to say about this. Yeah, people aren't always going to like it. But the bottom line is having a, especially as a Christian, having a healthy understanding of your own faults and sinfulness helps you deal more graciously when you hear bad stuff when they're saying it to you. It really does. I want you to think about Paul. As far as a man, I don't know if there's anybody more godly than him. Zealous, right? He'd get beaten, stoned to death, and you know what he does? He goes back into the city to encourage the people. But here's what he had to say about handkerchiefs. They would take handkerchiefs in the book of Acts. It says his handkerchiefs, he'd wipe it, and the people would be healed. There was an anointing on that man. Well, listen, <laughs> this is what it says. This is what Paul says. This is in 1 Timothy 1.15. Here's a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. He says, Paul says, Christ Jesus came to save the world, excuse me, came into the world to save sinners. And this is after he's saved now. And he says, of whom I am the worst. Having that healthy viewpoint. You know, that's why I, I remember you saying this before my, to my mom before she died. Well, she would hate when I said this. Man, I just feel like I'm the worst, you know, because I know what I've done. Maybe you know what you've done. But that gives me heart to not be quite so quick to pull the trigger and judge others, right? Because I know what a sinner I am. Apart from Jesus... Oh, you're so humble, you're so nice. You're so... I'm the opposite of all those things. That's Christ living in me. Isn't that awesome? Yeah, yeah, absolutely awesome. I, I like what Spurgeon says about this in his book, my lectures to my students. Spurgeon had a chapter uh, titled The Blind Eye and the Deaf Ear. And in that chapter, he gave wise advice to both the pastors and also to Christian workers. And, and he said that they ought to often simply overlook kind and thoughtless things others would say and do. We would not want to be judged by our worst moments. We should also not judge others by theirs. And he also said, I love this quote, 
You cannot stop people's tongues. Therefore, as a Christian, the best thing you can do is stop up your own ears, never mind what is spoken, and just keep serving the Lord. I need to hear a little bit more of that. Amen? Listen, and, and you just live a good life. Can I tell you, I've had people say all sorts of things. Now, I, I'd be lying if I said it didn't affect me. It hurts sometimes. It's hurt you too, hasn't it? Can I tell you something though? You know what I keep doing? Keep going. And you know what? A lot of times I, I, I get them coming back saying, you know what? Man, I, I see it now. I was wrong. And Stephen, you got a word, brother? Or yeah, just praising the Lord. Okay, yeah. You got it, bro. People are probably tired. Need a break from hearing me anyway. So I was at work the other day and uh, this inmate, he gave me a, a paper that had verses on it. He's like, uh, Harrison, you should read this. You know, I think it's very important. It was some Bible verses. And at first I was like, why should I listen to this guy? Because, you know, he's a murderer. He killed his whole family. He burned his house down, this, that, and the other. And I went back to my office, and I was just sitting there for a while. And, I'm, and I was like, you know, I should take every opportunity and just use it for good, you know. Yes. And it says right there, we should not judge others by their, you know, by their uh, worst times. Yes, absolutely. So. Listen, God wants us to live such good lives that though people will accuse you of doing wrong, in the end they'll see your good deeds and they'll glorify, their God, glorify God in heaven. Amen? That's 1 Peter 2.12. In the last few verses, let's go 23, 24. I know, it's long and depressing, but that's Solomon for you. It says, all this I tested by wisdom. And I said, I am determined to be wise. But you know what? This is beyond me. Whatever wisdom may be, it's far off and most profound, and, and who can discover it? Listen, if you really want wisdom, he, he's trying to look at wisdom without Jesus, without God, and he's like, I, I still come up short. But, you know, when it says, that's why a relationship with Jesus is so important. Who can discover it? I can. It says, in Christ, in Jesus, are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. If you have Jesus, you have his heart, his word, his spirit, you got everything. The whole kit and caboodle, that's the key. And everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. It says, so, verse 25, it says, So I turned my mind to understand, investigate, and to search out wisdom and the scheme of things and to understand the stupidity of wickedness and the madness of folly. He says, I find more bitter, listen to this, guys. I find more bitter than death the woman who is a snare, whose heart is a trap, and whose hands are chains. The man who pleases God will escape her, but the sinner she will ensnare. And you can read this for yourself. We don't have time, but you just read Proverbs 5, all the whole chapter. Proverbs 7, read the whole chapter for yourself. But this is Proverbs twenty-two fourteen. It says, the lips of an immoral woman woman." is a deep pit, and he is abhorred by the Lord, huh, will fall into that pit. In other words, an abhorred in Hebrew, that word means cursed. So God's saying, hey, you're going to be cursed. You're going to fall right into it. Men, you want to be dumb? You're gonna, God's going <laughs> to, you're going to be cursed of the Lord. You're going to fall right into that trap. And then he ends kind of with this. 27 to the end of the chapter, he says, look, says the teacher, this is what I've discovered, adding one thing to another to discover the scheme of things. Well, I was still searching, but not finding. I found one upright man among a thousand, but not one upright woman among them all. Well, he has a little bitter opinion of women, doesn't he? You know, in 1 Kings eleven four, maybe he was writing this, I think it, as he was growing on in years, it said later in life, he said all those wives he had, he's a knucklehead. He has 700 wives, 300 concubines. So the, the women that he has, I, I don't know if I can say this right. It, it, it says that they turned his heart from the Lord. But can I just tell you something? Guys, it, it, it'd be like, I, you know, pastor, I keep looking for women here and there. I can't find a good woman. Well, where are you looking? Well, I was, you know, I'm hanging out at the bars and the strip clubs. And, well, what do you think you're going to find there? A doy? 
And ladies, I can't find a good man. Well, there's plenty of good men in church. Well, oh, yeah, I guess you could go there. But listen, be wise in your relationships, right? If you don't have this kind of an attitude. And then he says in verse 29, the, this is the only thing I found. God made mankind upright. But men have gone in search of many schemes. And in the end, that's right. He did make mankind originally. He did. It says in Genesis that God created man in his own image. He created the male and female. There was no problems. And then because of sin crept into our hearts, we all have this disease called sin. And it's corrupted all of us. It's caused us to scheme and think self-centeredly, selfishly. And God doesn't want that for you. I don't even know how to say that but he doesn't. God's created you to be with him for a relationship, life-giving relationship, not just information getting. That sin is passed on person to person, generation. We're all born with it. Jesus, that sin can't be removed by good works. That's why we need Jesus to reach down and save us. That's why we need to ask him to save us, right? And he will reach down and do so because he alone can pay that price. And his righteousness can save us, forgive all our sins, and give us everlasting life, give us a new heart and new mind. Isn't he amazing? Why, wouldn't, why would you say no to that? It's a free gift. It's cost God everything. All you have to do is believe and receive. Let's pray. Father, I want to say thank you for every person here in our body, Lord. What a blessing they are to me and more importantly to you, Lord God. I pray even in this tough book of Ecclesiastes in chapter 7, Lord, that there will be some, some things in here that each one of us can glean, Lord, that we can hide in our hearts so that we won't sin against you, Lord God. I pray that no one here would would try to get out of here just by getting more information or wisdom, but they'd want that life-giving relationship that only you can give, Lord God. And I pray if anyone here has kind of forgotten about that relationship, that you would stir them up right now to let them know that you are personal and real and pursuing that relationship with them, Lord God. And it's life-changing, Lord. I pray in Jesus' name that you would help us all to leave here with these things on our minds and on our hearts, Lord God, that we would choose to live godly lives for you, not because we have to, but because we want to, Lord God, because no eye is seen and no ear is heard, no mind is even conceived what you've prepared for those who love you. And I ask a blessing on everyone's heart here today for this week, Lord God, as they go throughout the week, Lord God, that they would keep you and the eternal things of God in mind not like our friend Solomon, Lord, that they would keep you at the forefront of their mind and what they say and what they do. And I ask for that blessing of relationship in Jesus' name. And all God's people together say, amen. amen, amen. God bless you guys. Don't forget experiencing God. If anybody else wants a workbook, come see me.